Hey, Paul, here you are. Yeah. Uh, since uh, this afternoon, we are talking about uh, causal inference, causal analysis. Um, and you have been working on causal inference and machine learning uh, for a while. And you have done some reviews recently on causal machine learning in making business decisions. And you published some blogs about causal science and especially how that's used by large corporations, by industry. So any interesting best practices or pitfalls you, you see in this area that we should be aware of? Yeah, several. So, uh, I mean, we had this, uh, this recent survey uh, where we uh, really tried to understand sort of, first of all, what are the questions that are data science practitioners? So we mostly talked about uh, with the data scientists um, in industry, various uh, sectors, um, different companies, mid-size, large size. Um, and uh, well, so first of all, we see a lot of interest more and more. So it seems to be really emerging topic. Probably the book of why from 2018 had something to do with this. Um, but at the same time, like it's still very much in the beginning. So companies trying to, to engage with that topic, uh, but they definitely see a need uh, and they see a need because, uh, so this was our hunch when we started this project that actually many of the questions you care about in business uh, have some form of causal flavor. I mean, you, you have the, the pure prediction problems as well, right? That are uh, discussed in, in the books like prediction machines or so, the, the credit card fraud that you want to detect or uh, you want to predict customer churn. So that's all well and good. Uh, but causal inferences, especially the question, right, of predicting the outcome of your actions. And there, I think it's immediately clear that this has sort of something to do with, with managerial decisions. Um, and yeah, so lots of interest um, still at the beginning, but I think the, the ecosystem is moving fast and probably in, in one or two years from now, uh, we will see um, much more applications already. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, one big, I think, uh, bottleneck that that we saw and identified is of course first of all knowledge uh, about the topic as such and and there we as, as business school professors right need to play our role i think um but at the same time it's also even if you're trained in machine learning and and you have a super strong background in statistics uh causal inferences is, is a very different mindset because um well uh, if, if you're coming from an ML background, you, you're trained to, you know, sort of data is, is the holy grail and, and let the data speak. And that does not really work well uh, if, if, you, if we're talking about causal inference, uh, because there you always need to approach it with some form of um, domain knowledge or background knowledge. Um, and that also poses some interesting organizational challenges, which we are currently exploring. You, you talk about yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's, that's a very good summary about uh, cause inference and it's a rising importance in the industry. Now you talk about the main expertise. So how, how, how do people sort of translate the main expertise into data science to make causal inference? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because um, I mean, what we've seen in our interviews and then also the, in the survey that we run, uh, the way like data science teams are structured at the moment is almost like this competence center, right? Or almost like an in-house model, in-house consulting model. Um, and, and you sort of have different projects and, and then you go into different teams. Um, but uh, like, it's very much centralized, like in, in a specific team or department. Um, while we would argue, I mean, you can structure that on, on a project basis, right? But what you uh, really want is you want to bring people with a more technical background and people with the with the actual domain knowledge being in the field together mm -hmm. uh, and our impression is that this is not happening yet uh, as much as we as we needed to um, and and this is a big bottleneck and something that we are currently actually trying to do re research on and on how to make this uh, knowledge exchange uh, happening and and sort of so this old question in, in innovation economics of how can an organization learn what they already know, so to say, mm. right? Uh, so, uh, and, and it's a, a form of boundary spending uh, that, that has to happen. Can you, I don't know if you have thought about this, can you think of one example 
uh, in which um, it is so necessary to bring in a domain experts, a domain expert to either interpret or help build a causal model, so we can infer uh, decision consequences from from data. Yeah, so so I can talk maybe about a recent project um, yeah. that, that we're having. So this is with a with a large uh, supermarket chain in the Netherlands. So uh, one of the two largest in the Netherlands. Um, and they're thinking about uh, sustainability issues and, and sort of reducing food waste. Um, and, and they're having initiatives like, uh, for example, dynamic markdown pricing and so on. Uh, but again, like really, so they're sitting, uh, you know, in, in the headquarter close to Amsterdam. Um, and then they're trying to analyze all, or they're, they're analyzing all this data from all the different stores across the Netherlands and sort of in a central way. And they do some form of A-B testing as well on, on trying to, to optimize this, this dynamic markdown and so on. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to a causal model and, and this kind of domain knowledge, at one point you really... Yeah, you you uh, run out of depth, so to say, right? If uh, as as a data scientist, and you really need to, um, yeah, harness this kind of domain knowledge from from people on the ground, and then sort of store managers or, or middle managers, um, who who can provide you really valuable insights about what it is that that drives sales and and food waste in in the stores, and and this is something that. Um, yeah, people in in data science that coming from a technical background, they simply don't don't have this knowledge. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's uh, difficult then to, of course, get this conversation going because you need something very specific from from these people. They are not necessarily trained or often not trained at all in, in uh, machine learning and uh, in causal inference. And uh, yeah, we're trying to currently to explore sort of best practices, how we can most effectively get this conversation going, basically. Mm. Can you uh, educate us um, uh, without background in, in, in a lot of research on causal model? What, what is the typical uh, process of developing causal model? What are some of the key things to consider? And what's the process, like first step, second step to develop a, a very good causal model analysis? Yeah, so I, I mean, there are different ways and, and different schools of thought, uh, but uh, I'm very much a proponent of, of the graphical pro approach to, to causal modeling because I think uh, it's, it's also uh, intuitive enough that uh, you can actually, uh, you know, uh, do the causal modeling on a flip chart, which is very useful if, if you want to tap into domain knowledge of, of practitioners. Um, and uh, well, yeah, then, then the uh, first step uh, is, is simply like sort of identifying the phenomenon that, that you're interested in and, and analyzing. And that would mean sort of in ML terms, it would be feature engineering to some degree, right? You need to uh, figure out what kind of variables you're interested in, what, do you, what kind of data do you need to collect? Um, and then, well, there, there are some data-driven approaches like uh, causal discovery algorithms that, that you can use in, in order to have a first exploratory step. Uh, but uh, I mean, you can show theoretically and, and you will figure out in practice very early that this doesn't get you uh, all the way, uh, right? Uh, so, so you will always need to complement it with some form of of, uh, well, background knowledge, that's a term we, we like to use in machine learning, but I would simply say it's a theory, right? And there it connects very nicely to, to some form of discussions we have in, in management, sort of that uh, we need a good theory of our business model or theory of the firm in order to be effective. Um, and, and there's sort of where data science and, and business meet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I want to follow up on that. So, so by causal graph uh, based on the school of thought, uh, you mean uh, things like causal diagrams, structural equation models from uh, uh, Judy Pro's work, uh, mm -hmm. and etc. Now, uh, there's also another school of thought on the uh, potential income uh, method, where people criticize on um, this graphing model. Uh, and mm -hmm. the main point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, okay, you, you're going to have some knowledge about how the world works first before you can develop a causal model. But what mm -hmm. if we don't know how the world works? 
Yes, uh, I mean, so yeah, potential outcomes or quasi experimental school, right? Um, uh, I mean, it, it's a valid criticism that uh, basically the starting point there is you will always have some form of unobservables, right? That you can't measure influence factors that you might not even be, be able to name. Um, and so um, you can circumvent that by, and that's the, the approach in science that, that we take since, since Fisher, right? By, by running an experiment. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Problem is, well, tech companies do that a lot, right? They, they follow this approach, especially if they're sort of uh, active online, uh, A-B testing and these kind of things. Uh, but for many important questions, even in, in a tech sector, you, you can't run experiments, right? Either because the outcomes are, are too uh, long in the future and an A-B test is usually just done for two, two weeks or so. Um, or it's simply too costly or unethical to, to experiment. So then you do quasi experiments, right? So you, you wait for sort of nature to provide you this exp uh, ideal experimental setting. Um, and that's what we do in research a lot. Um, but uh, do you, well, like in research, we often look for the experiment first and then ask the question later. Um, and you can't do that in business, right? So uh, they're, they're the question comes first. Um, and then often you, you don't have a great uh, quasi-experimental approach at hand. Sometimes you can, and then we show that in our paper, right? These techniques are used, um, but, but they are definitely not uh, yeah, the holy grail. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Mm -hmm. now, now, Paul, you mentioned the quasi-experiment, and I, mm -hmm. I see in the chat box uh, one uh, asked question related to uh, RCT, uh, randomized mm -hmm. controlled trials experiment. And, and by the way, we have several uh, students working in the healthcare and medical areas, so mm -hmm. they are quite familiar with the RCT, the experiment um, uh, type of approaches for causal inference. So how do we how do we sort of take the best of the worlds of both RCT and machine learning in the future? Yeah, I mean, there were uh, many uh, uh, interesting methodological uh, developments recently, right? The work by Athey and co-authors uh, using machine learning in order to uh, investigate heterogeneous uh, causal effects or heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, I think that line of work is, is very interesting because it allows us to move away from, from sort of this average effect that we're measuring. Um, but I want to come back to, to one point, um, what you said about sort of, we need a model of the world, right? And, and whether we could uh, sort of circumvent that with, a, uh, with an RCT. And I think there's an interesting case just recently, there was a blog post by, by Microsoft Research um, and they were facing exactly that question of, um, well, we have a lot of experimental knowledge. We, we do A-B testing all the time in our organization, but now we have this wealth of experimental results uh, from maybe two years back uh, prior to, to COVID and the pandemic. Um, and now they were asking the question like, are, are these results still valid or has the, um, has the world moved on? And, and do we maybe need to repeat all of these experimental results in order to figure out you know, what, what counts now? Um, and that is a classic, well, if you're trained in, in uh, epidemiology, you would call this an external validity problem. The computer scientists call this a transportability problem or transfer learning, um, right? And if you want to solve that problem, you, you again, um, uh, are left with the same problem. You need to uh, make theoretical assumptions and, and bring in domain knowledge in order to decide uh, whether effects are transportable. So there, it's again this, the same question. Even though you can run RCTs, uh, you never get away with uh, sort of background knowledge in causal mm -hmm. Now, uh, based on the conversation, it seems causal model is too much a good thing. It's uh, it it's, it helps making management decisions. It uh, uh, makes more reliable prediction of the outcome and uh, tells you the consequences of your actions, etc. Is there any limitation of causal modeling? Is there anything causal modeling cannot do? We should not uh, apply causal model to certain kind of questions. 
Well, uh, I mean, the, the big drawback is, is I think that it's more complicated, right? Exactly for, the, for this reason that you cannot just uh, use a standard algorithm and, and sort of uh, minimize uh, your loss function and, and, and that's it, or at least uh, optimize fit out of sample fit. Um, so, so it's much more on a case by case analysis, right? So you, because you need this domain knowledge and you need to apply the, the correct tools. Um, so in that sense, I would say we're still trying to, to actually highlight the benefits of causal modeling because it's not yet applied so much. Um, and we're trying to uh, figuring out the best, uh, especially from a business perspective, right? The right organizational structure in order to minimize this cost and, and, and sort of, um, yeah, bringing this, this domain knowledge to the table. So I think mm -hmm. that is probably the, the biggest drawback, um, mm -hmm. especially when you see, I mean, uh, organizations are already struggling with, with all the engineering time that goes into standard machine learning approaches, right? Um, and I would be curious to know if, uh, if organizations apply a causal inference more and more like how that would compare in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. If they do apply causal inference more and more, that they do need to uh, merge or find a way to integrate domain expertise into yes. that data, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in your survey, you mentioned, and some of the other works you have done um, and interactions with the companies, uh, where do they draw the domain knowledge? Do they draw from consultants, internal managers, or business schools? And what is the role for us to contribute to the main knowledge? Well, for us, I think it's a it's a good thing. Uh, if you if, if you're worried about uh, you know machines taking over our jobs, because this is a clear indication that uh, it will not. It it will at least uh, until we get the the automated causal modeling going. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, where it's coming from, it's a good question. I'm asking myself that as well. Um, like, uh, yeah, we, we, as I said, we're, we're now uh, working with this Dutch supermarket chain and there uh, we, we actually want to explore different team configurations, for example, um, and which are mo uh, to see which are, uh, configuration is most uh, effective in sort of um, getting causal modeling uh, going or, or getting domain knowledge to the table. Um, I know of, of tech companies who actually have dedicated sessions with, the, with their employees where they try to draw uh, causal diagrams on a flip chart. And I found that very interesting. Uh, but I think we don't have good answers there yet. Like what is the most effective way? That's, mm. that's just what we're starting to explore. And do you think we, we should have a systematic answer on how to develop a domain expertise? Because otherwise it becomes like a power in the politics. Right, who, whoever has the larger voice will, will decide what kind of knowledge that is. And that's a, that goes against the very purpose of using data to drive decisions, because we want to have some relatively objective scientific evidence to make decisions. Right? Yes, definitely. Uh, we, we need uh, best practices. I mean, it, it will always be individual, uh, like on a case by case basis, right? probably. So, uh, yeah. The, the projects and the questions differ and, and the approaches will differ. But I, like you say, I think we need at least uh, good guidelines in order to prevent exactly these kinds of problems. Um, and, and then it's not just one senior manager who, who uh, decides everything, but uh, we, we need to bring different voices to the table. Uh, and uh, yeah, just harness this, this knowledge that is already existing in the organization. All right, so we are right on time. Thank you so much, Paul, for visiting. And Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll uh, keep an eye on more good work from you on cause of inference. Uh, so that's something I care a lot about personally. It was great to be here. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.